So the New Testament lesson for today comes from the Gospel according to Mark, and it's a series of three small parables. Now you notice that the Old Testament lesson, the Hebrew scripture that was read, was also a parable. We tend to associate parables with Jesus and the Gospels, but in truth, parables are part of the faith tradition of both the Jewish and Christian communities. Ezekiel talked about how part of a tree would be broken off and it represented the people of Israel, how they would flourish under God's care. So listen to these parables that Jesus told as recorded in Mark chapter 4, verses 21 through 28. Jesus said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under the bushel basket or under the bed and not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except that it will be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. So let anyone with ears to hear listen. And Jesus said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. The measure that you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given to you. For to those who have, more will be given. And from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is, this, is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, and then the full grain in the head. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, draw near to us once more. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's actually hard to write a good sermon about a parable. Because by definition, parables are already a type of mini-sermon. Parables are designed as short stories, as vignettes, that invite you to ponder them, to mull over and consider how you might apply them to your own life. Parables are designed to be both memorable and a little bit mysterious as they layer in meaning in a few words. And that's exactly what makes them hard to preach on. With parables and with jokes, if you have to explain it too much, you're probably messing it up. Well, in the Gospels, there are about 30 parables that are attributed to Jesus Christ. Many of them are widely known, even by people who don't necessarily darken the doors of church sanctuaries. There are famous parables, parables like the shepherd who goes and seeks the lost lamb, or the prodigal son who eventually staggers back home to a waiting parent, or the good Samaritan, the Samaritan who cared for the man who was beaten and left by robbers, even as the powerful and the pious passed by and avoided him on the other side of the road. Parables are invariably about doing what is right, what is just and merciful, and how by doing these good deeds, we're aligning ourselves with God's plans for this life and for the life to come. Now, the three parables I just read from Mark chapter 4 actually aren't among the greatest hits, aren't among the ones that everyone might be familiar with, but they each give us a lot to think about. So the first parable asks a simple question. What are we supposed to do with lamps? Well, lamps are designed so that their light shines all around, that it chases away shadows. And in effect, God's word is like light, that we are called to look at what it illuminates and then act accordingly, see ourselves as now created in God's image and worthy of self-love and respect and see others illuminated in God's light as worthy of care, especially those who've been up till now hiding in the margins, obscured by darkness, by prejudice, 
hidden on back roads or behind bars or in nursing home walls. See, the light is designed to illuminate what is fundamentally true, that there be no more secrets, no more self-hatred, that hopefully through the light there be no more racial bias, no more double standards, because the light is designed for all as it shines on all. So let those who have ears hear and live in the light. The second parable asks us to imagine that you're a shopkeeper in a store and consider the measure and the scales you're using to sell your products. And then it asks, well, are you generous or are you stingy? Do you help those in need or do you find yourself holding back, hoarding what you've got just for yourself? The parable captures the ideas around what is called virtue ethics. Virtue ethics are the idea that by doing a good deed and then doing another one and another one, you develop the habits that are reflective of a faithful and virtuous life. The preacher Eugene Peterson described this type of life of good deeds as, quote, one long obedience always in the same direction. So the parable says, well, If you use your measure generously, that will be the way goodness is received from others. If you use your measure sparingly, well, then you'll probably fall out of the habit of doing virtuous deeds until slowly and slowly, almost no good deed comes your way anymore. Sad, but true. And then there's the third last little parable about seed that is scattered on the ground, but a seed that grows while the farmer sleeps. By God's design, that seed takes root, changes from a hard kernel to a young plant, then to a stalk, then to a budding grain, and eventually to a full plant of wheat or barley ready to be harvested. Now, Jesus was preaching largely to an agrarian society, so these type of agricultural metaphors made the most sense in his world. But to balance out perhaps an overfocus of the second parable with its light shining and intense focused on good deeds, this parable calls us to live a life where we literally rest in the promises of God, a God who provides for us providentially gracefully, who's the ultimate source of what we would call a healthy and a flourishing life. Now, those are the three parables. So the question is, do these parables still work today? Do they still preach to us? Well, we're not really an agrarian society, particularly not right around here in East Liberty. We're kind of more of an Amazon, Google, Facebook-y kind of society. But if you think about that last parable for a moment, there's actually a lot that transfers to our current setting. In the parable, it said, the realm of God is as if someone scattered seed on the ground, and then they slept night and day. And when they arose, the seed had sprouted and grown, but he or she did not know how it happened. The parable is saying that faith in God is like a sleepy, restful trust. We do our works during the day, and then we lay down at night while God continues to hold the world in God's own hands. Our heads may hit the pillows, and we rest and sleep, but in the morning we awake to a world where God has been at work, where ocean currents still ebb and flow, where breezes blow, where seeds sprout and where children are born, and life moves onward, guided and held by God. To have a restful trust in God. Now that's not the same thing as a lazy trust in God. We are working partners with God. We're not freeloaders in the realm of creation. And we have free will, which means we have the capacity to choose good or evil. And that too is all part of God's design. 
We are called to be impatient when it involves matters of injustice and evil. We're called to be patient when it involves times of adversity, knowing that sorrow may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. In these uncertain times, when so many voices are telling you, you just need to do more, you just need to work harder, you just need to compete in the rat race as best you can every day, this parable reminds us to rest, to be still, and to trust in God who goes ahead of us and who is Lord of all of our days. Now, I read a story recently in the paper that actually struck me as almost a modern parable of this very idea. There's a woman named Genevieve who shared in an essay that just before her 12th birthday, her mother died of breast cancer. Her mother had been a businesswoman, very active in her field, who was always prepared. By day, she was writing marketing slogans and five-year business plans. But at night, she was caring for her daughter with bubble baths and pillow forts and bedtime stories. When her mother found out that she first had cancer, she immediately filled the dining room table with medical journals and research to understand what her treatment options were. When it became clear, though, that the cancer was not going to be resolved, the journals were replaced by wrapping paper and ribbons and string. She died 10 days before her daughter's 12th birthday. But on her birthday, Genevieve's father then carried into her bedroom a large gift box that had been prepared by her mother. And inside the box were packed packages and letters designed to be opened at all the different milestones of her daughter's life, the milestones that the mother would now sadly miss. Times like when she got her driver's license or at her high school graduation. In fact, there was something for every birthday until the girl would turn 30. And they were all there in neat rows of wrapped gifts, lovingly prepared often while the daughter had been sleeping, unbeknownst to her. And so on that day, Genevieve opened the package that was marked 12th birthday. And in the package, she found a small amethyst ring. And the card from her mother said, I always wanted a birthstone ring when I was a little girl, and your granny finally bought me one, and I loved it more than I can say. So I hope you like this one. Happy birthday, darling girl. Love, your mommy. Now, year after year, Genevieve's mother, in effect, traveled forward in time to meet her, always there in the guise of a little package with a pink ribbon and a white note card. Happy 15th birthday. Happy 16th birthday when she got her first period and didn't want to talk about it with her father, a four-page letter was there laying out practical advice. It invited her to make friends with herself, to not lose herself during these challenging years, but to rethink and discover what values she should hold dear. And when she was 18 and graduated from high school, she opened a box to find a strand of pearls. Since, as her mother said, well, there's a tradition in their family to give pearls upon graduation. And so on and on the notes went. Congratulations on your driver's license. Happy 18th birthday. Happy 21st. Always happy birthday, my darling girl. And one of the notes said this. I'm sorry to be leaving you. Please forgive me. I know a box of letters and tokens can't begin to take my place, but I wanted so badly to do something to ease your way towards the future. Love, your mommy. Now overall, it was a beautiful essay to read. In this world, 
challenge and struggle and loss belong to the structure of life itself. To wish somehow that the world were immune from every form of suffering is to wish not to have been created at all. But the gospel reminds us that through it all, God is near. God is at work. God is loving and merciful and goes before us and will never forsake us. And that good news is too deep to be put into theological volumes or even lengthy sermons. That good news deserves to be wrapped in small packages like the gift of a parable. So listen once more. The kingdom of God is like a lamplight that freely shines over us all, illuminating what we most need to see. The kingdom of God is a measure that is generous in its giving and that calls us daily to be generous in response. And the kingdom of God is like a loving mother who prepares for her daughter a gift box for every momentous event in her life. She goes ahead of her and is there when those times come, times both good and bad, of struggle and of accomplishment. And in those moments, she offers words that encourage. She offers a small gift of grace that sustains. And she offers the reassuring promise of watchful accompaniment, of always being awake even while she sleeps, that she might rest in peace. And together, they will spend their days, both for this life and for the life to come. And together, they will produce a harvest that is rich, that is just, that is loving. But anyone who has ears to hear, listen. Amen.